follow that. <laughs> follow that by taking a walk around Ireland on the 16th of January 2016. Follow that by going to Golden Island at Lone, where today they're still pumping the water from people's homes. Where this week we saw a Longford man, John Clark, brought to his final resting place in a boat, his coffin carried in a boat. And that today the N18 near Cool Park is still underwater. And the road that's designed to replace it, the motorway, is going to have to be redesigned because the, the engineers didn't reckon on climate change. It would be underwater if they built it the way they thought it should be built. The insurers are saying they can't insure because we're, we're not talking about the risk of flooding anymore. We're talking about certainty. No one weather event can be used to illustrate climate change, but a pattern can. The insurers can see it. Increasingly, the people can see it. It's a shame that the government can't. We had the extreme embarrassment, as Catherine said, in Paris being there at the century the birth of our nation loomed, listening to the Taoiseach trying to wriggle his way out of firm commitments to worldwide effort to tackle climate change. The status quo is all that the current government is selling, but the status quo is over. We need the Green Party back like never before. If the question in this election is about where we go from here, then the answer from Fine Gael and Labour is they want to keep everything the same. They're promising to secure the recovery by sticking to the current path, but their approach is in fact the more risky one. They're ignoring the fact that we have to learn lessons from the past and that we have to keep adapting to what is going on in the world if we're to truly secure our future. You would think that the Labour Party would be up for a change. Back in 2010, they took the very enticing political decision to kind of let on that there were easy solutions in dealing with the banking and budget bu bubbles that we had to face. It was never going to be easy for them to turn around, but they made it worse by using what freedom they had over the last five years to agree budget decisions that tax the rich less than the poor. Fine Gael have a similar credibility problem because they were all promising before the last election of a democratic revolution and political reform. But in the reality, their, instinct, their instinct is to be more conservative. When the vista, the glorious vista opened up for them, that finally after seven years of Fianna Fáil domination, they were on top. They couldn't but resist that innate sense they have that they are the state. People were not blind to the fact that they've been pointing two of their own people for every one Labour pick. They see political reform as a numbers game, cutting local government just to save money rather than to change the way that politics works, further centralising power wherever they could, replacing the dev portraits with Michael Collins in his Jotpur's outfit, telling the Garda Commissioner at the same time that he had to go when the shattered thing got out of hand. Both parties seem to think that adhering to the economic orthodoxy that has held sway, as far as I can see, for the last 35 years, is still the right way to go. They seem blind to the fact that the international and crash in 2008, financial crash, changed everything, changed everything. It exposed the innate instability and risk in the current economic model. The world never stays the same. And the belief that markets know best that less government is better, and that the financial markets know what they're doing, is no longer credible. If we want to secure the re recovery, then we should be recognising the flaws in the current system and starting to do things differently. Thomas Piketty is right. That massive slice of the pie that goes to that top 1% needs to be shared out in a different way. Our European Green colleagues are right that we need corporate tax justice, that the one trillion loss each year in tax revenue to the tax avoidance screens that exist must end. Now, we've got to be on the right side of that change, working with the EU and the OECD as they bring in a fair model, rather than just sticking to business as usual, as, that is going to, as if that's going to suit us well. 
rather than changing the ways, what we were seeing is a return to the same old politics that got us into our economic problems in the first place. Are we going to buy that false promise once more again that we can both cut taxes and at the same time improve services into the future year on year? We signed up to European fiscal rules that means that that game is no longer going to work. And this great January election giveaway that we're seeing every day in our papers ignores the fact that the global economy is still very much on edge and we need to be careful in our budgetary policy. Who knows, knows where the price of oil is going to go next or what the consequences are of what's happened to us in the last two years? Who knows with any certainty whether Mr Draghi is going to keep the printing presses rolling in the way that's completely transformed our economy in the last two years? Who knows if the Chinese government is going to be able to stop their own credit bubble popping? Every political party political broadcast you hear in the next six we weeks with all those promises, should be ended, which you know that at the end of the banking ads, you get this thing, this Irish government is regulated by the European Central Bank. Investments may go up as well as down. <laughs> you would think some caution was called for after what we'd been through, but not a bit of it. We're back in Charlie McCreevy territory. If we have the money, we spend it. If we don't, we won't. That is not a long-term economic plan. Whatever about ignoring these lessons from the past, by ignoring climate change and the environmental challenges we face, what they are doing is risking our very future. By their actions over the last five years, that they've shown that they've no regard for the need to live in a sustainable manner. They don't seem to realize that there's no jobs on a dead planet. You cannot farm a flooded field. The economy is a subset of ecology not the other way around. And looking after nature goes hand in hand with looking after each other. Thank God the world seems to be waking up to that reality and is starting to react. We've known what we need to do since the UN conference right back in Stockholm in 1972 on the human environment. And the publication of the Brundtland Sustainable Commission report, development report in 1987. And it's taken us 30 years to finally come round to agreeing what we're going to do about it. That moment has arrived. We've just been through two hugely historic agreements that can change the way that everything works. In New York in September, the world agreed to 17 sustainable development goals that apply to the global north just as much as the south. It's a manifesto for the future, not just about the environment, but about eradicating poverty, providing health, education and justice for all. That agreement was followed by a truly historic climate agreement in Paris. As some will rightly argue that it does not go far enough, but what it does provide is a detailed legal agreement where every country commits to avert runaway and dangerous climate change. It will establish a transparent system of assessment of how each country is performing and requires to ramp up our ambition in a way that can no longer be ignored. Now, after that historic high, the real hard work is to be done. Who do you trust to deliver on that headline agreement? It's our job to get out there. It's our job to work with every other political party in a coalition in respectful ways, with all sides, left and right, to make it happen, to deliver it, to set that as the future destiny for our country from now. What it is, is the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era, no less. It's going to be replaced by a new energy system based around the development of renewable power and efficiency in every sector of a new circular economy. This is happening. This is for real. It's just a matter of time. The environmental movement has changed tack and recognised we need a new way of helping make the transition happen. Rather than putting all the emphasis on the individual actions and individual responsibility, we're seeing the start of a new divestment movement which recognises that we need to tackle the source of the problem, the fossil fuel suppliers. We got it, we're going to this year, not just on the election trail, but also on the campaigning trail. We need to keep four-fifths of the known fossil fuel reserves, reserves in the ground. That means we have to stop burning peat and coal. That means, thou do we not start fracking for natural gas. 
But if we're to be serious and play our role in this new divestment movement and establish Ireland as a green country in a real way that goes around the world with notice, then we're also going to have to shelve any uh, allocation of new licences to explore for oil and glass in Irish offshore waters. We want to know in this election campaign what the other parties think of this divestment strategy. Are they for real and climate change? Or do they just want to pay lip services to the changes we now know we need to make? The reason why we can make the change is because the alternative is becoming mainstream. And it's a better option. It's a better society it will provide for us. The price of renewable power continues to come down. And the level of investment still continues to rise, even with oil at $30 a barrel. Latest figures out the other day. That's not stopping the revolution taking place. The financial community is starting to wake up to this reality. People are starting to sell their shares in oil and gas because there's too much risk. I think we're going to turn off the oil tap by keeping oil prices low, not by seeing them going through the roof. Because when that happens, the offshore and the shale deposits are no longer economic to be developed. And if we then regulate against the use of coal and wind down the use of gas as we switch up the alternative renewable power supply, we have a way of tackling this problem. It is a way which is now we have the technology to do it, or we lack, as Al Gore has said in the past, is political will. And that's changed because we have 200 countries signed up to say, yep, we're going to do it. That's the historic shift. If we miss out on this energy revolution, if Ireland miss out, we're also going to miss out on the digital revolution that's also starting to take hold. The two go together. And they're driving a new industrial revolution that will provide pro productivity growth right across our economy. New jobs are going to go to those countries who lead the way. And if we opt out, we will be left behind. There's a real risk of that now, because our government and key sections of the public service do not get it. I have this vision of ministers and officials behind the government buildings, behind the net, net curtains sneaking out. What's going on out there in the world? They're not aware. Or they, they're aware. They don't believe in this transition, despite all 200 other governments coming up in Paris to say this is for real. Implementing the New York and Paris agreements are actually going to give us the one great hope, which is true and central to this party, of living in a more peaceful world. No one's going to hold another country to ransom over solar or wind power. The great advantage of renewable power is that it exists everywhere, in one form or another. And we've seen the consequences of that alternative oil supply, the resource resource in the Middle East. We can see today, whatever about the 6th of January in Dublin, the 6th of January 2016 in Syria, the oil fields are burning and children are literally washing up on our shores. We have gotta do something about that. Going this alternative direction is the way, it's the peace project, as well as everything else. We're not gonna be able to bomb our way to greater security over pipelines or oil wells, but we can work in collaboration to develop everyone's own local renewable power supply. That's what the Paris deal sets out to do and can make happen. It's the most effective reply to the terrorist strikes that struck in Paris a month before the climate negotiations. International consensus is the very last thing that the terrorists want, and therefore it should be our first line of defence against their madness. Acting now also gives us one chance of averting the inevitable mass migration and conflicts that will come if we don't stabilise our climate and protect the natural systems upon, we, upon which we all depend. If we fail to act, the consequences of Ireland may not be immediate. But could we live with ourselves if we decided not to play our part? I don't believe the Irish people would want that. No matter how secure we might be and isolated we might be, I don't believe that we would want to live in such a world and in that way and take that role. The transition has not been easy because there's a lot of vested interests protecting the status quo. It's also hard for both those on the left and the right to buy into the alternative because there's a vital role for both the state and private enterprise 
which one or the other side, left or right, does not like. But we Greens are also business people. We see there is a role for business. And we see as well we're public servants. We see there's a role for both and support both and work in collaboration with the both together. We understand that business also requires, and property requires a regulatory system that makes sure it follows its responsibilities as well as having its rights. The decentralized and distributed nature of the two revolutions, digital and energy, that are taking place means that this revolution is ripe for cooperative enterprises. Those enterprises were there at the start of the first industrial revolution, and they were right there at the start of the foundation of our state, but they've been in the wane since. It's time for us to get them back. It's time to dust off the thinkings and writings of Horace Plunkett and go back to our great strength and history in cooperative movements, which have a role as well as in the private enterprise and state sector. This is a three-way transition that we need to support. What it also requires, which Richard Doutwaite recognised, is a massive new investment program to build better buildings, communications, transport, energy, and other infrastructure. We have to build today, and what we build today is going to be in place for decades to come. So when we're designing it and building it today, unlike those poor road engineers who designed the new motorway down in Gort, we need to design for the future that we know is coming. That's why our slogan in this election is think ahead, act now, because we have to rebuild our country. We have to build in a whole range of different ways. And building that requires us to bring the future right here now and think now about how we build for that future. Our political system is not good at long-term thinking, but that's what we have to do if, we've, if we have to build right. To get it right, we need to reverse, and we would do this in government with real fight, to sh the short-sighted decisions that Alan Kelly set to lower our planning and building standards. As a mark of our Republican centenary, how would we not have a system where we ensure that every single person lives in this state in a proper home? The first job of any government is to ensure that the fundamental needs of the people are met. You start by making sure that they have proper shelter and a warm home for everyone, as I said. There's political census across the parties that we need more housing to cater for our growing population, for bringing our people home, immigrants, and for catering for new people coming to the country. The question is, how do we build? At the moment, we have no spatial plan. So if we get into government, that has to be first item on the agenda. Now, we believe the focus should be bringing people back towards the centre of our villages, towns and cities. It will be a more social and efficient country when we can walk or cycle to our school, workplace or public house. We make that case not to widen any perceived gap between urban-rural divide, but simply to recognise that we cannot keep going with urban sprawl. And nor do we want a countryside where so many houses are not lit up at night. The truth is that rural communities, the farming and forestry communities particularly, are going to be centre stage in this transition. Not just meeting our basic needs for healthy food, but also managing our land so we adapt to the climate change that is already inevitable. We will have to recognise and value and pay for some land areas where natural services such as flood protection and biodiversity are the first priority. In other areas, we'll be growing wood to provide heat for our industry and our homes. And in better land, we'll have to switch to food production which minimizes emissions and maximizes the price for the farmer rather than the food producer. This is not impossible, it's going to take time. The, but the latest research from Tragus, Tragus shows that environmental sustainability and agricultural productivity go together. It's about using less expensive inputs and using technology to manage, manage and monitor what's going on in our land. Our soil, we need to get, as Fergus was saying earlier on, our soil right, protect it. The biggest obstacle is make, to make the switch is a social one. We are so obsessed by owning and holding on to whatever land we have 
that we make it difficult for a new generation to come forward and do things in innovative ways with our land. It's not just about allowing the eldest son or daughter to inherit the family farm at an sta earlier stage. We need a new system where other young people who have no direct access to title on the land can get secure access and the necessary capital to innovate and sell into a local market. We need to kickstart the cooperative movement to make this happen. And we need new ways of selling and distributing the food to our own people. Why not an English market in every community, or the milk market in Limerick in every community? Why not adopt the sort of community support agriculture schemes that are growing all over the world? Do that, and then we can sell our surplus produce to the rest of the world under a true origin green brand. Because changing our land is going to take time, we're going to have to need the transition in energy to be completed sooner, by the middle of this century at the latest. That is not a hardship. It's an opportunity to provide massive employment and economic advantage for our people. It starts by making our homes more comfortable and less expensive to run. And we started that work in government, but it's time now to ramp it up on a whole new scale. We need to deep retrofit every home where we wrap the building, put a solar panel on the roof and change the heating system, and do it in a systematic way. It's expensive, and it'll require innovative financing mechanisms to make that happen, but such models are starting to appear in the rest of the world, in Europe and America, and they can be applied here. And in the long run, while there's an upfront cost, the savings and the comfort and the health benefits, this is a sensible and clever thing to do. And the employment. Every Irish builder would have a guaranteed job into the future of this country if we set about to do that. We need creative enterprises to work out which technologies are going to win out in the switch away from fossil fuels. But one thing appears increasingly clear. The future is going to be electric in how we heat our homes, run our cars, and power our industry. We are blessed with some of the most abundant renewable power supplies in the world. We are also based from some of the most leading technology companies who increasingly realize that their software and algorithms are going to play a vital role in the management of this new variable power supply system. We want to make Ireland one of the things we go in to seek to go into government to do is to make Ireland a test bed location for the integration of these two industries. Get it right would be increasingly about how you encourage behavioural change and not just technology. We're not going to shame people or introduce punitive fines, but we can work out, if we work out, how do we create real value for people in their everyday lives? That's where the change will happen. And the job of politics is to help people to do the right thing for the environment and for society without it having to be a moral daily choice. Make it easy for us to make this switch. Making that happen requires the right sort of ethical rules-based system where people trust in the sharing of data so they can provide services to them in a really efficient way. Now, those rules and those ethics have to be centred around the interests of the citizen first and not the, any government our corporation. <laughs> Just as the Enlightenment created the cultural conditions to nurture the first industrial revolution, we need, need a new political and cultural enlightenment to suit this evolutionary leap the world has to make. That sounds big. Maybe that sounds high blown or philosophical, but that's where we are. Would you? If when you assess reality of where we are, that's, the ch that's what we have to make. It is a massive evolutionary leap akin to the first industrial revolution, if not bigger and more. And I think we in Ireland can fill that space of being a space where that culture exists. And we can help it as a Green Party develop, because we don't ever condone corruption. We do condone. We, we condemn corruption. <laughs> We don't take brown envelopes, unlike some councillors we've seen on our telly recently. And as Václav Havel recognised when he was speaking about the European Green Movement, he said he liked our stance. He said it was non-ideological, and he says our advocacy is non-violent. That's part of the culture that's going to make this new revolution happen and take place, take hold. <laughs> we think globally and act locally. We promote an economic model that respects the rule of law,
and measures success in the improvement to the quality of life and not just material economic growth. We are comfortable and open with transparency in all government business and the sharing of public information in a way that the internet can now allow. We don't think TTIP does that. We want fair trade, not just trade fairs. We are not against globalisation, we just want it to be done in a way that works for everyone, not just the lucky few. The next government will have to sign off on these new rules. Fine Gael and Labour should open the books before the election and tell us what has been agreed so far, so we can have a proper debate. Yeah. We have to ask the question, why is everything being done behind closed doors? One of the best ways of making this transition and managing the variable power supply, which is the centre of what we're going to need to do, will come with the arrival of electric vehicles as a new standard car. They're going to win because they're a better car. Fuel costs less, maintenance costs a fraction of what the other car is. My car is just broken down today, don't I know it? And they're better fun to drive. Um, at the same time, while they're good and attractive cars, we're going to have to reduce our dependency on the car, no matter how clean its power supply. Because unless we build the proper public transport alternative, our cities are going to choke as sure as night follows day, and with it our economy will choke. This is a big social as well as environmental issue. And because the government shelved the big public transport projects, it's going to take decades now to deliver that rail-based alternative. What we need to do in the interim is invest in more flexible local cycling, bus and pedestrian alternatives. This is where the social bit comes in because those help people connect together in a local community way. We want to start by instigating a new Safe Routes school programme. Allied to a revision of those entry rules Catherine meant to so that people are brought back to live close to where their local school is or don't have so far to travel. And getting our young people the freedom back to travel safely to and from school it keeps them fit, it connects them with the world in a better way, and it connects them with each other in a better way. If we're going to bring people back into our urban centres, which I said, as I said, should be the centre of our spatial plan, then we need to create a local environment that is really special. We need a massive programme of introducing new greenways, community gardens and local parks. Providing that connection to nature and green space is not a side issue or a luxury. It protects our very health of mind. And building such healthy communities has to be a cornerstone of improving our health system. A green health system, as we heard earlier today, would start with a greater emphasis on prevention and primary care. And again, as we heard earlier today, one of the ways in which we could deliver that is our give our community nurses much greater power. In particular areas where we are difficulty in getting GPs to cover, we should be using highly trained nurses to do the key prescription and other procedures that they're well-trained and able to do. Such changes are part of what we need to do to keep people out of emergency wards. They're part of what we need to develop, which is a holistic health system. And that's one where everyone is treated the same. If we're going to get our climate change response right, we're also going to have to manage north and south I was very proud here today, Stephen, the, the leader of the opposition in the Northern Ireland Assembly, Stephen Agnew, the leader of the Green Party in Northern Ireland, was here. Fresh from his bill in setting out children's bill, fresh from his work in completely uh, dominating the whole welfare debate issue up in the Northern Assembly. I've been interested talking to Stephen about this, but I think if we're going to get a response to climate change right, we need to manage our island north-south in a more coordinated way. When you start for flood, planning for flooding, as we need to do on a river catchment basis, you see that Donegal is linked to Derry in a way that cannot be ignored. I asked Mark Deere the other day, what's your river catchment basis? I'm part of the ban, he says. We connect it. Nature doesn't recognise the borders, and we have to manage nature uh, now in a clever way. We have everything to gain from learning from each other and sharing our experience, experience, expertise and resources as much as we can. One of the first most difficult decisions for the next government will be what to do about building an electricity interconnector from Meath up to Tyrone. 
despite the fact that it would save money for all consumers, is one of the few things that Sinn Féin and Fine Gael in the border counties seem to agree on. They've been doing everything they can to stop it being built. The op op opposition on the northern side of the border was just the same. Politics doesn't change that much, either side of that divide. Having worked for Arlene Foster for several years on the establishment of the All Ireland Electricity Market, I know it's possible to work in such cooperation north and south that I seek. We need to pick up the aspiration that she gave or she expressed in her speech to the DUP, uh, or in her inauguration speech last week, when she said she sought to seek accommodation rather than conflict. Now, we should start such cooperation and accommodation by saying, making sure that the interconnector does get built. And I think I would like to go further and suggest that we look for cooperation in establishing a corridor between Belfast and Dublin to say, set that location as the centre of a new testbed location for new low carbon technologies. We'll be competing for investment in that sort of space with a northern powerhouse that George Osborne, Osborne has in mind. And we will need the scale and the combination of resources we have on both sides of the border if we're going to win. We already have examples of collaboration that is working. Children with heart conditions in the north are treated in the matter. Patients in Donegal who can't get to hospital because it's so cut off from the rest of the Republic are happy to go to Achnacloy. That's the sort of collaboration I think we need to enhance and promote as a celebration of our 100 year anniversary of proclamation. We also need to work east-west as well as north-south and not just compete with our British neighbours. Our economy always gains when the British economy is strong and we have massive spin-offs from the fact that we are so close to the global financial centre in London. Our country took a bit of a back seat in the Scottish referendum, but our party made clear our support for our Scottish Green colleagues' call for an, in an independence vote. This year, when it comes to the Brexit referendum, we cannot be so silent. For all the failings of the European Union, and we saw some of them firsthand, it is the sort of collaborative to mechanism we need in this world to make this new cultural transition to create the conditions to tackle climate change. So we cannot give that up, and we cannot afford to see Britain leave. It's already under real crisis in the European Union. I mean, the financial crisis hit hard, the, the refugee crisis seems to be even bigger and more difficult to manage. If Britain leaves, our union could fall apart, and that's not in our interests. We do not want that. We do not want borders coming up again in Europe. We're seeing it happen at the moment right across the continent. That is not part of a future that will work. So if elected into office, the first thing I would like to do is head over to my British colleagues and make the case for Europe. I should do the same with my relatives while I'm over there. I have 10 first cousins, and there are a lot of other Irish people there, and they're not an insignificant part of the vote. I think we in the Irish political system need to stand up and start getting engaged in the debate because it's in our interests and we cannot ignore it any, any longer. When it comes to reform at home, if elected into office, can I propose one thing? That we need to concentrate on local government reform. Phil Hogan got the reform of local and regional government wrong in two critical ways. Firstly, when it came to regional government, he divided up the country with all the creativity of a cost accountant. We need five or six regional authorities with real powers rather than the three gerrymandered quangos that he put in place. At the more local level, we need to start making the public partnership networks work by providing a new tier of leadership at a local level beneath county council level. In the early 80s, 90s, we built up a network of community development partnerships and family resource centres which played a remarkable role in helping disadvantaged communities tackle issues relating to consistent poverty. They were centred around decision-making which came from the local, local people and from leadership from local people rather than from elected officials or, elected officials or, or public officials. They were starting to be a real success and then they were cut. Well, we need to get them back. And I think as we get them back, we need to broaden it. Yes, poverty eradication as its core, but why not give them the responsibility of taking a wider role? of looking at how we can actually promote a local environment and create green spaces, looking at how we might support local food production and distribution, looking at how we might support local community energy systems, looking at how we support our local business community. 
So rather than this system we've created, where the state is at the centre providing services for the needy, we get the community to take leadership again. That's not front page grab the headlines, but anyone involved here, anyone involved in local office knows that that's the sort of citizen, that's the change, the Republican change we need, where people see themselves as the state, not the state as some distant force. We enter this election with 40 of the best candidates you could hope to pick. We enter united, committed, experienced, new people coming in. We do not have a penny to our name. We are running this entire thing on an entire voluntary effort. What a message it would be. What a message it would be if we carry it off. What a message it would be. What a message it would be to the people of Ireland. Politics is not all about money. You cannot kill a good idea. So we're in a row with RTE because they've decided to exclude us from the leadership debates. Like the government, their criteria for inclusion are rooted in the past. But whatever about that battle, we go into this election with a positive approach. I commit and I ask every one of our candidates to agree here and now, and if anyone disagrees, tell me to it. But we commit to accept what Taoiseach said. This should be a respectful debate. Yeah. Oh, to all candidates and to all parties. <laughs> and in return, I would respond to the Taoiseach with this request. If, RT, if you want a debate which is respectful, and if Archie is not going to allow us to be included in any debate, Taoiseach, will you come and debate in some location that you're choosing, in whatever format or whatever moderation you want to put in place? But Taoiseach, once over the next six weeks, will you come and meet us and sit down and talk about how we tackle change, uh, climate change in a respectful, broad, no-agenda way? We will take a collaborative approach in this election. We're working together with each other. And we will also, we've tried to be clear right the way through this whole process when it comes to the formation of a new government. We've made our position clear. We will work with everyone, adopting a positive approach as to should we enter in government or indeed in opposition. We need a different form of politics, maybe one that just doesn't concentrate all the time on what's wrong, but let's look in this state as what's working and let's get more of that. And you can do that from opposition as well as government. It's one of the changes I would like to see in place. But to make it happen, we need a team of people elected to the Dáil. Politics is a team game, and we need a team back in Dáil Éireann if that green voice is really going to work. We go there to serve as well as to lead the people. We go to bring practical solutions that will improve the quality of their lives. We go with an ambition to set the destiny for our country, which looks to the future and not the past. Some, pays, some people say in Ireland, oh, the Greens, the people who work out 20 or 20 years later that what the Greens say makes sense. That would be too late. We need to act now. The leaders of 1916, whatever our view of them, believed independence was an idea whose time had come. They set out to grab history. Well, the Green message is more relevant and more important than ever. We have to grab history and shape the future. And I believe the future now is one about inter interdependence as well as independence. The two go together. That's what green thinking, that's what ecology brings you. The interconnection, the interdependence we have with ourselves and with nature. We have no time to wait. We think long term, we think ahead. We act now. I'm asking you to vote green in 2016. Let's get a green voice back. Thank you. Yeah.